Hey everyone, this lesson is on the infectious disease known as tularemia. In this lesson, we're going to talk about what causes this condition. We're also going to talk about risk factors, pathogenesis, signs and symptoms, diagnosis, and how we can treat it as well. So tularemia is a zoonotic infection caused by the bacteria known as Francisella tularensis. So Francisella tularensis is a gram-negative aerobic bacteria. And the condition of tularemia is also known as Francis's disease, rabbit fever, or deer fly fever. There's many other names as well. The transmission of this bacteria occurs through contact with infected animals. So an example of this is through rabbits. That's why it can be also called as rabbit fever. So rabbits and rodents can act as a reservoir for this bacteria. You can also get this through tick bites. So a tick can bite you and can actually transmit this bacteria as well. And some animal bites as well can also transmit this bacteria. And another one is exposure to dead animals. So the risk factors for this condition are related to the transmission. So certain occupations are more at risk for getting tularemia. Certain occupations like veterinarians, farmers, hunters, meat handlers, and landscapers. Another risk factor is eating uncooked or undercooked wild meat, particularly rabbit meat. You can also see it through camping as well, just because of the tick bites and other exposure to infected animals. What is the pathophysiology of this condition? It is a highly virulent bacteria. So it actually only takes about 10 to 50 bacterium to cause an illness or infection. And Francisella tularensis is a facultative intracellular bacterium. I didn't mention this before, but it can actually live within particular cell types. So it actually infects macrophages in a host. So macrophages are cells responsible for phagocytosis. And what happens is the macrophages actually phagocytize the bacteria like they're supposed to, but the bacteria can survive inside those cells. They actually replicate inside macrophages, and they can also replicate inside neutrophils. And through replication, they continue to replicate, and they essentially lead to a lysis of the cell. So the cell essentially dies and basically ruptures, allowing the spread of these bacteria outside of that cell to infect other cells. So they can continue to infect other macrophages and neutrophils. What is the clinical presentation of tularemia? Tularemia actually has a very wide spectrum of signs and symptoms. It can be anywhere from asymptomatic to septic shock and death. This actually has to do with the particular bacterial subspecies that causes the infection oftentimes. It might not be, but there's actually two subspecies I didn't talk about before. There's actually Francisella tularensis subspecies tularensis, and there's also another subspecies known as Francisella tularensis holarctica. So the Francisella tularensis subspecies tularensis can actually cause a more severe clinical presentation, whereas the other subspecies doesn't cause as severe a presentation. When Individuals do have symptoms. The symptoms occur abruptly, so there's an abrupt onset of symptoms. After about an incubation period of around three to five days, the symptoms are often nonspecific and they are systemic. So there's systemic symptoms like fever, chills, malaise, and fatigue, those types of symptoms. So there are actually six different forms of tularemia. We're going to talk about each of these in detail. So a lot of information coming up. The first type is ulceroglandular. So if we break down the word ulcero, ulcer, and glandular, glands. So it has to do with an ulcer and glands. So this is actually the most common form. So as its name suggests, there's a skin lesion and there's lymphadenopathy. So swollen, tender lymph nodes. So you can see here in the posterior cervical chain, you can see there's some lymphadenopathy here. We also see fever with this form of tularemia. And we also see a usually single erythematous ulcer that is slightly raised with a central area of eschar at site of inoculation. So wherever the perhaps the tick had bitten, you might see something like this, this kind of raised ulcer. And you may also see some subcutaneous nodules as well. And again, this has tender regional lymphadenopathy. So we oftentimes see it in the cervical chains, and we can also see it as a occipital lymph node that is enlarged and tender as well. And these lymph nodes can also become superative. The second form of tularemia is glandular. So again, just look at the name. All it really means is that there is glands involved. This is actually the second most common form. 
We have tender regional lymphadenopathy, very similar to the first form we talked about. Again, these lymph nodes may become superlative, but there's no identifiable skin ulcer. So we see the lymphadenopathy, usually again, cervical, and we might also see an occipital tender lymph node, but no identifiable skin ulcer. So that's the second most common form. The third form of tularemia is oculoglandular. So break it down again, oculo, something to do with the eye, gland, again, the lymph nodes. So this actually has both glandular component and oculo or ocular component. So there's an infection of the conjunctiva of the eyes, usually through rubbing of the eyes. So if you have bacteria on your hands and you rub your eyes, that may be a way to introduce a bacteria into the conjunctiva. It may occur through aerosols as well. Usually it's unilateral, so one eye is being affected, whereas the other one is okay. So you may see something like this. There's a red swollen eye with chemosis and a runny eye. So you can see pain and photophobia. So photophobia is just a sensitivity to light and, again, increased tearing. We can also see, again, because there's glandular in the name, tender regional lymphadenopathy. So again, very similar to before, you may see other types of lymphadenopathy, not the cervical, but more preauricular, posterior auricular being involved. You can also see cervical uh, chain being involved. And the infected eye may also have some corneal ulceration as well. The fourth common type of tularemia is pharyngeal. So pharyngeal, pharyngeal means it's about the throat. So this actually occurs through direct ingestion of the bacteria contaminated food or drink. So the mouth and throat are involved. We have a fever, sore throat, neck swelling. So usually we see exudative pharyngitis. Exudative means that there's just this white exudate. And the pharyngitis, it's a, it's a sore throat, essentially. Pharynge means throat. Itis is inflammation, inflammation of the throat. Again, we can also see cervical lymphadenopathy. And we also may see pharyngeal or tonsillar ulcers. The fifth presentation of tularemia is known as mnemonic tularemia. There's primary and secondary pneumonic tularemia. Primary is essentially when you breathe in the bacteria into your lungs directly. It's a direct contact from the bacteria into the lungs. This can occur in farmers, lab workers, sheep shearers. So with primary pneumonic tularemia, these patients can have fever and cough, malaise, so they can be very tired and they can have myalgias, so sore and achy muscles. And if we were to take a look at a chest x-ray, we can see pulmonary infiltrates, low bar consolidation, pleural effusion, and we can see hilar adenopathy. So we can see hilar adenopathy here. It's actually bilateral. It may actually look like sarcoidosis, but you can see hilar adenopathy with pneumonic tularemia. And the other presentation is secondary pneumonic tularemia. This usually occurs from another site being infected with the Francisella tularensis bacteria. The bacteria can travel through the blood, so hematogenously, and it can go into the lungs, causing a secondary pneumonic tularemia. Usually, it's bilateral lower lobe involvement with this type of presentation. And with both of these, with pneumonic tularemia in general, the skin finding of erythema nodosum is more common. And the sixth clinical presentation of tularemia is known as typhoidal. So typhoidal tularemia, it's a systemic febrile illness. So patient has fatigue and malaise. They have a fever and chills, but they have some other symptoms as well. The big key thing about typhoidal tularemia is that they don't have regional lymphadenopathy. Basically, all the other clinical presentations have lymphadenopathy somewhere, but this type does not. So this is the big key component to recognize with typhoidal tularemia. There is no regional lymphadenopathy present. We can see fever and chills with typhoidal tularemia, anorexia, so they have very low appetite, headaches, myalgia, so again, sore muscles, sore throat, cough, and abdominal pain and diarrhea. So these are the, the key symptoms you want to think about here, abdominal pain and diarrhea. So these are very different than the other clinical presentations. And oftentimes they can have very diffuse abdominal tenderness. And if any or all of these presentations are not treated appropriately, or they are left untreated, individuals with these conditions can have chronic and recurrent fevers, have long-standing fatigue, anorexia or low appetite, weight loss, and weakness. So these symptoms can last a long time if this condition is not treated properly. So these symptoms can last for months. 
So it's important to be able to diagnose this condition and treat it appropriately. So how do we make the diagnosis? So the diagnosis of tularemia is oftentimes suspected based on the symptomatology and risk factors and some of the other things we talked about earlier in this presentation. So think about those six forms of tularemia. If they've got a skin ulcer and they've got some regional lymphadenopathy and they've got some risk factors, you can think about this as a possible diagnosis. You can think about some of the other symptoms in those different types of tularemia to help you come up with a suspicion that this might be tularemia. More specifically, though, we could diagnose tularemia with serology testing, so looking for positive antibody titers to Francisella tularensis. You can do a bacterial culture, although this bacteria is very difficult to culture, so this may not be a good test to use. And there are some new testing with PCR or polymerase chain reaction to actually assess to see if this bacteria is present. So once we make the diagnosis, how do we treat tularemia? So treatment involves using streptomycin or gentamicin, usually through intramuscular routes. Fluoroquinolones are also known to be effective and tetracyclines as well. So these are the antibiotics we can use to treat the tularemia. So the key is to actually make the diagnosis of tularemia in the first place. This is something we call a master of disguises. It can look like many different types of conditions. So, and it has many different clinical presentations. So it's important to have at least a basic knowledge of what this condition might look like, especially in infectious disease environments and with regards to individuals who are at risk for getting this condition. So it's good to know about at least a brief overview of this condition. And once we make the diagnosis, it's important to understand the treatments. They are a bit odd. Streptomycin and gentamicin, fluoroquinolones and tetracyclines can be used as well. And if this is not treated properly, we can have long-standing issues with fever and fatigue and weight loss and other issues that can last for months and months. If you want to learn more about other infectious diseases, please check out Q fever and Lyme disease. These also can have very odd, non-specific presentations as well. And if you found this lesson helpful, please consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribing to the channel. Any and all support is greatly appreciated. And as always, continue to live, laugh, and learn. And I hope to see you next time.